Welcome to the Blarney Pilgrims podcast. Hello. Uh, today we've got a fantastic interview. Uh, fantastic. Every interview is fantastic. We say that every episode, but this one is, is particularly fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Keep sounding It's down. super fantastic. With Beth McCracken, flute player, and um, she plays with Declan Simpson. She was playing at the National Celtic Festival in Port Arlington. We managed to snag her on a Sunday afternoon, and we've got a really interesting personal sort of uh, deep dive into the difference between growing up in a, in a classical tradition, learning how to play in a classical tradition, and then moving into the folk tradition and uh, what that represents, um, particularly for Beth. And so it's really great. So listen up for that. We're, it's coming up in a couple of minutes, but we just wanted to say a quick word about Patreon and our sponsors, which are you. So essentially, we never want to have the corporate sponsors. We don't want to have to stop... The podcast halfway through to try and sell you something it's just feels wrong it's not what we want to do what we do want to do is build a community of people and and build a product that you guys think you know what the, the guys deserve a, a dollar or two so we have a patreon which you've probably heard us mention before maybe you don't know what it is the patreon is a well, patreon is a website which allows you to donate a small amount of money each week for the arts whatever it is and in this case it's a podcast yeah so and this is to basically help us um, pay for scooting around the country pestering musicians to talk to us yeah. in different in different times so yeah. so you can find that at um, patreon.com p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash blarney pilgrims you go there and you just follow the instructions you'll figure it out and any support would be fantastic and again i just want to say a real honest thank you to the patrons that have actually come over and and started subscribing to us it out of everything it's the thing that really affects us because you're you're putting your hand in your pocket and you're saying keep the good work going lads yeah. and it it's really humbling when we get those subscriptions coming in so thank you brilliant okay and now beth mccracken Thank you. 
McCracken and Declan Simpson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so that much. That was for awesome. Us. <laughs> okay, so what was that tune? Um, that set. That was the set that we call "The Uppity Duff," <laughs> and it um, so it's got uh, Tom Crawley's, my former wife, and the bluebells are blooming. So wow. three jigs. That's that. That's kind of right, like who in. Yeah, we don't we don't mess around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, you can tell straight away. We've got that's... a bit of a life is short approach to play. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, w- what's your kind of origin story for this for this music? Where where's the spark for you? Like who who introduced you to it? Where, to you Irish hear it? music? Yeah, where'd you in hear general? it? Um, so, my parents really liked folk music, mm-hmm. um, and a friend of theirs from the states sent over a cassette collection called a festival of irish music um and at that time i was like my mum's favorite way of entertaining me was sending my she'd be upstairs and she'd send me downstairs to um basically dance around to music and that was how i occupied myself when i was little so um she had all sorts of things she'd put on the classical music but um as soon as these tapes arrived i just it was just those tapes Mm -hmm. that i wanted her to play and they had the like Classic bothy band sets. I think I had Clannad yeah. on it. Clannad, you're the first person we've spoken to who's mentioned Clannad. Yeah. yeah. We usually yeah. have uh, Planksty Bingo by this stage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think there was any Planksty on them. Wow. I'm not sure. Yeah. But it, it was the bothy band stuff that really yes. stuck out. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's quite interesting. That, that early Clannad, mm. early Clannad before, before the synth thing happened you know when they were doing yeah. those those early albums when they had those they had the stand-up bass on there and they had a lot lots of sort of almost sort of jazz influences yeah in them. look yeah. i had no idea what i was listening to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i wouldn't have a clue i just sort of kind of liked the sound of it so. what age were you around this time then four. <laughs> oh right okay yeah. so very very, very young. young yeah yeah and and then um what was your uh, um, playing background as you as you grew older? Like, what, um, I your... really wanted. I, s- I started out playing piano when I right. was eight. Um, and was this in Melbourne? Were I was in, in Brisbane. In Brisbane, yeah. Okay. Um, and then, and um, mum always had this story about she w- always wanted to play flute, and her mum made her play the clarinet, but I was allowed to play flute. <laughs> um, so, you know, as a five year old that wants to be like mum. I decided that I wanted to play flute too. Um, and uh, in Queensland, you can learn pretty much whatever orchestral instrument you want through school. So I started learning flute through school and then got a private teacher and then was sort of just on the kind of generic you fa- classical path. Were you fast-tracked? I, I mean, f- mean, was it clear early on that you had an aptitude? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And just I was obsessed. <laughs> right. Um, but the, the sort of... The interest in folk music was sort of going along in parallel with the classical. Like there was a festival up there called the Mullaney Mul- Celtic, Celtic, Celtic Festival, festival yeah. um, that I went along to and saw um, saw people playing whistles and was captivated. And um, then that became Woodford, so I was always going along to that. So yeah, there was always these sort of two experiences of music side by side. When you're learning to play classically in, in an orchestra what are the kinds of uh, I, 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 so I have a vague memory of you know studies and things that you used to practice on like yeah. do you remember like things that you used to play like studies that were kind of 
and grinned and you uh yeah um like when i when i was doing classical music at uni like um almost every aspect of what you bring to the flute is it technically is kind of torn apart and you would practice everything se- separately so um when I was sort of really going for it, there'd be like maybe an hour of sound, just sound exercises. And then, you know, two hours of like technical drills that cover like almost every possible combination of notes you could possibly play. So does that have a, does that have a a name that style? Is that like Suzuki or? Uh, Oh, no, no, it it doesn't. It's just, um, it, it's, I think it's just what the French, um, the French school of, uh, flute tuition was yeah, okay. was doing and that's what's sort of being brought down because they ended up being the best at it <laughs> and, and <laughs> so. Sound, so sound exercises would be embouchure and breath and things like that yeah that? embouchure breathing control listening to pitch all of that kind of stuff mm-hmm. yeah can, can you uh, are you able to demonstrate any of that oh god <laughs> no, I, I know I'm putting, um, you, I'm putting you in the spot here but okay, it's just going to yeah, be interesting yeah it's... so the very first one I learned was and you can't really do it on this because it's not yep. chromatic but um, was just like descending slow notes and just trying to get as even a sound as you can from them. So, <laughs> repeated, um, yeah, so 20 minutes of that, and that was the, the warm up to the sound exercise. That's intense. Yeah, wow. That yeah. is intense. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, quite, I'd imagine quite physically intense. Yeah, it right? is. It is. Yeah. But really, um, the only way you're going to get that muscle memory down, yes, right? Yes. And the the whole point of doing all of those exercises separately is to give it the most attention you possibly can, um, because when you're actually playing, you you just don't have the mental capacity to be yeah. thinking of seven different aspects of your playing at once. So. And, and at this point, when you're at uni- university, we've kind of skipped very quickly over, yeah, <laughs> over, <laughs> over a long period of your life. But yeah. I, I, um, uh, you mentioned early on about being obsessed. I mean, did you find it easy? By that stage, you're kind of committed, right? You're in yeah. that. You're in that lane. Yeah, I was far more interested and obsessed, I would say, by traditional Irish music than I was by classical. Like right. by by the time I got to uni, I was definitely. Oh God, definitely rebelling against something. Um, I'd say I was probably doing that from the age of fourteen or fifteen. From a musicality point of view, or from a academic point of view? Both. Right. Yeah. So what happened? So you, in in those in the in your teenage years? Yeah. Like, can you, can you, if you look at the. If you, if you think <laughs> okay, of, let's settle in. Well, I went through a few parties. What didn't happen? <laughs> what didn't happen? Um. Oh gosh. Um. I think, like, I really loved music, but there was just something not sitting right for me with the classical stuff. And so the the way I would sort of play and enjoy it would be, like, learning learning Irish tunes Mm -hmm. and figuring out how to ornament them. And then um, a girl I did Irish dancing with, her dad um, is quite... uh, quite a... What's the word I want? central figure in the Brisbane sort of folk scene uh, plays um, accordion and fiddle his name's Terry Jacob Um, he's English so he's kind of spans English Scottish Irish folk and I was dancing with his daughter and they took me to my very first session Um, and I think that was (laughs) I think that was probably what radicalised me (laughs) like the um just the idea that you could all sit around with a group of people there was no there's no one really leading or in charge you were just there to enjoy playing music together you weren't performing there were no stakes you would chat and connect to people it was just a completely different scenario for playing music um because all I'd learned by that stage were exams and a Steadfords and and auditions and competitions so and that's a lot of sheet music too, right? You're it's you're reading at that stage yeah. still. Yeah, you are. You are. And so that's a big departure when you start going from reading to just playing by ear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Was that something natural for you? Um, I think, I th- I think so. I think I think it was easier, just because I'd been listening to it and got exposed. I think so early. Like I mm. think that sort of implicit understanding of the structure and the the um 
the tonalities, like the modal tonalities, I think that was sort of already in there. Yeah. But um, coming through your teenage years as well, I'm wondering about um, was there a competitive element to the classical? Oh yeah, absolutely. Approach because it's a lot of it's based around that because it's isn't it it is. a competition. Yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, levels? all of those all of those sound exercises came out of the French sort of flute school that was all about competition and half the music that they wrote was just about how to show off the instrument Mm -hmm. to the best you know to to its best so yeah um and then also like we were lined up at uni and set you know told like you're all here because you want to be musicians it's highly unlikely that even one of you will make it into an orchestra so rethink your future (laughs) So then when you get exposed to a session, I get it. Because I'm only learning about what that French method or the Suzuki method is like. And I've heard this story before where people say they went through that school of of learning, then they hit the folk, whatever type they get into, whether it's Celtic or, or other styles, and all of a sudden they got, I don't need to be in the orchestra, and I still can get all those... I can still be creative and get those emotions from playing with other people. Yeah, I I I think of that in terms of ownership. Okay. Um, because like going through going through high school, like we would play music together, but it would be in like a concert concert band, and so like, you know, you have to buy sheet music, and there has to be a conductor, and there has to be rehearsal times, and um, this was like music that that was kind of ours, and we just sat around and played it, and we didn't need some kind of boss lady up there waving a baton at yeah. us. Um, Can you give me an example of, of an, uh, you know, one of the one of the experiences that you had, um, like an, an example of one of the experiences you had where you're like... Flip oh, the bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, s- oh, man. Like... S- yeah, I'm, I'm choosing. I've got mm. some doozies. <laughs> um... <laughs> Uh, there was one in in second year uni we got to do like an ensemble and i wanted to do a traditional irish ensemble and the lecturers were like oh no look we need you know that that's okay if you want to go out and have fun in a pub but you know you need to be doing music that's actually going to challenge you and grow you like so there was a there was just this real, I don't know, there was almost like this disdain for it that came through. Um, and even, I think even with my parents, like I told my parents that I really, you know, they, they knew I really loved Irish music and, um, yeah, my dad's American and I remember him saying, Beth, you've got to let go of these pipe dreams. <laughs> 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 so, um, yeah, there was, there was a lot of, so your father's American and your mum's from Australia. From Australia, yeah. right? And uh, that I was actually going to ask you, like, how were your parents taken to this this course that they've sort of steered you towards, and then you're like, no thanks. Mm. How how was that? Did, how did you come out to them? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they always knew. <laughs> they were just in denial. Um, they. Uh, they they just didn't understand like they they and i don't think i think a lot of the sort of older music teaching generation just didn't understand that music um in australia even is is just taking its own course that the idea that you have to be in an orchestra and you know if you want to be a musician this is what your life looks like um that 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 was basically out of date at that time and that being a musician looks so different for so many people just in like the same way that the the number of professions out there available to people now are just exponential and um yeah so they they just didn't understand at all was was it hard i mean was it hard yeah yeah it was just in but i mean you know as hard as it is for any teenager teenager to like be so misunderstood by their parents. <laughs> parents are so and, phony. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have a couple of questions around how you then relate that into your own teaching. But maybe we could have a tune or, or a song first, and then we we'll get back into that. Yeah, sure. Um, let's play the a, um, the polka. <laughs> Thank you. 
polkas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what were what were those? That was uh, the first one was Donica Lynch's, and the second one's called I think called the A B polka. A B polka. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Is there a distinction between Irish polkas and other? Yes. Can you? Ah, rhythm. Unpick that a little bit. Rhythm, <laughs> even within Irish, like so. Those yeah. were really kind of more sleep lucre style polkas, but there's um, Sligo Leitrim polkas as well, which kind of sound like marches. They sound like marches. Yeah. They're like slower and more. Uh no, the rhythm's just it's not about speed, completely it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And w- when did you make the transition from playing a concert flute then to to playing a traditional flute? Did that happen quite early? Um, I was always trying to play trad on a concert flute. Mm-hmm. Um, I made the tradition, the tradition, the transition as soon as I could afford to order a wooden uh, one. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I think I got my I first I got my first one was a Terry McGee, and I got that when I was eighteen. I mm-hmm. think. Yeah. And and what was that like? That Terry? Do you still have it? That Terry McGee? I do. You do. I do. Do you play it? No. Yeah. No, I meant I, ca- I meant to get it fixed up and to sell it, but I just never got around to it. Right, yeah. right. So who who's the, where does Terry McGee come from? Oh, uh, he's rural Canberra, I think. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. And and how was that? Uh, so it's a it's a different world, right? It's, it's really different. Um. The 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 embouchure, and then also just the absence of valves and yeah, the, even think, the balance of the yeah. the instrument across your hand, right? Yeah. So, um. The, the the hardest thing I think, though, is just rhythm and the way you use air. Um, so, and, and this has taken years to to master. If if, if even I've even got it, like um, class, classical music, you you keep things fairly even. Um, it, it's for me, it feels almost robotic the way you treat individual notes. So if you're playing like a group of four notes, it's pretty. I'll give you an example. Like, um, it. Um, so that's that's sort of a what you would look bring to a tune if you're a classical, and it's taken years to kind of realise that you know your fingers are doing very little. It's all coming from. God knows where. <laughs> so, um, that's dramatically different. It's so different. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that's that's so interesting. Uh, there's, there's a set, um, the the training that you did, like to 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 have to, um, sort of free yourself a bit from to that. To learn it. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's where I want to go before we had that the last tune. So you you had the background and you learned in that traditional sense. Yeah. And, and you teach at the moment too, right? Uh, uh, oh, just at have? like festivals and stuff. Oh, okay. Know, not, not. So do you, like, then what, what's your approach to it? Because you, you're obviously split because I'm sure you appreciate the, the the learning you got and the muscle memory you got from going through that yeah. method. What do you say to students now? So much of the work happens away from the instrument. Um, How so? It, so learning tunes, um, when I teach tunes, I teach people to sing them first before they even put it on the instrument. So, because you've got to just have it completely internalised. Um, I think just the process of teaching, the fact that you're teaching a tune by ear, not re- just refusing flat out to give them music, um, that all makes a huge difference. It's just immersion, like it's like a language. You, it, it's pretty interesting that the uh, that we, we talk about this in a couple of our other episodes about the difference between playing a tune from from paper and then yeah. and then having it in you and it, it applies to, to to songs as well. I mean, I'm no expert yeah. singer, but I do a wee bit of singing. And like even yeah. even I can feel like it's a whole different thing when yeah. I've got the song like really inside me, yeah. and then it's 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 ready to come out from inside me rather than. Yeah. Rather than the the mechanics of me sort of reading it and playing it. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. It's like um it's pretty mysterious. But I wonder for, for teaching that's that's probably quite challenging for for a lot of people who who want to be included, right? And in yeah. The, it's such a simple notion too. Because I've I've been told that before. Know the song before you approach it yeah. to learn it. 
And it's such an easy, easy step to skip. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this is going a bit deep or tangential or whatever, but um, it's just such a stark difference between how the two kinds of music operate. Like, I associate sheet music. It, I, I, it's almost this kind of, like, historical... I see it like live action role play almost like people doing medieval recreations in the park like for me it's that weird I love it that's um, a great analogy it, 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 uh, <laughs> just the lack of like to me it just represents a complete lack of ownership over being a musician and what being a musician is about I, I think you, you know we are a capitalist society music is seen as something that is a job Mm-hmm. Um, as opposed to a very important skill set that's part of a healthy functioning community and a way of being with other people mm-hmm. that exists beyond language because we all get sick of talking to each other at some point. Um, so, so, so yeah, just the distinction between sheet music versus by, by ear is just this tip of this iceberg about just the kind of world you begin to inhabit when you start getting interested or spiraling down deep into what traditional music actually is yeah that's a great take on it yeah and i mean you know like classical music was just so awfully elitist um and and just the the arrogance to kind of dismiss an entire culture because it wasn't you know, complex or intellectual enough was was just such a giant red flag. Does some of that come from the to be able to play by ear. You need to be able to find a groove and a um, a personality and a a drive that's yeah. very different. Yeah. And if you are so entrenched in learning by rote, yeah, to actually step out of that is quite a difficult thing too. So maybe some well, of that. My my take on that would be the difference between learning in this weird, sterile, isolated context versus, you know, being steeped in the music of a community where it, it just happens. So, like, when I lived in Ireland, it, that's, again, like, I was still an outsider um, mm-hmm. and ha- was sort of very careful and kind of, like, in the back of my head had all the kind of bit of the understanding of colonisation, like... Um, being an outsider there to kind of learn the music you, you, there there is I had this sense that there was something very dangerous about owning it too quickly for myself um you know very very much about really deferring to everyone around me and um understanding everything else that was happening around the music like like the stories about the people playing and the the friends and the connections of of the musicians to place to where they're from or to who they learn from. Um, mm-hmm. there's, it's just such a, it's such a rich experience. Um, and once you've had that experience, the idea of playing from sheet music is absurd. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I've got lots of questions about going to Ireland, what that did to you, how it changed you. But I, I was looking at, do what time it is do, can yeah. we can yeah. we have a tune and then maybe we'll move to Ireland yeah sure sure yeah let's all <laughs> <laughs> yeah. do you want to play them by yourself um yeah okay yeah, alright um <laughs> I'm 
Thank you. What, what, what were they? Uh, the first one was called The Stone of Destiny, mm-hmm. and the second one was The Bear Island Reel. All right. The so Stone of Destiny, is that a Scottish tune? Gosh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we, I, we only learnt it in our last trip back. So. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah great. It's a fresh great. import. So I wanted to ask you about your, about your flute. Uh-huh. If you could. So, uh, uh, so uh, um, who is the flute maker who made this flute? This so is one of Mike Grinter's mm-hmm. flutes. Yeah, and we should say Mike uh, died at the end of 2018. Yes, and he's uh, I, I didn't know him, but it, clearly he was he was much beloved in the music community here and yeah, and all all over the world really. Yes, uh, he was. He's a huge part of Melbourne. Um, you know, you'd, you'd kind of so we would play at a session called the Drunken Poet. Yeah, you know, Fridays. Um, very often, just expect Mike to rock up. Mm-hmm. And I'm still kind of finding it, like I still have that expectation. It's really hard to accept that he's gone. Yeah. Um, he absolute amazing flute, pr- best in the world, obviously, um, but just amazing person too. So yeah, yeah, it's been the the specialness of that flute has um, increased a lot mm. since Mike died. Yeah, which is kind of a hard thing to say like you know you, but but you know I think I think there was a sense of not understanding how special he was um, until we lost him so can you tell me a bit more about the flute itself then um uh, it's African blackwood it's a ruddle and rose copy right. Mike did a he has sort of two generations of flutes there's a old model and new model and this is a new model and I think the new model was bred for a bit more power um, and then I also um, I also wanted um, the embouchure just a slightly wider larger embouchure hole can you, um, can you tell me what is that? Uh, the, mount, the, the hole in the top that I blow in Okay. <laughs> I wanted a bigger one <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So I have to ask, there's so many Yeah, terms so much jargon. Around, and That's then I go, well, what was that? Yeah, yeah. Um, and and um, uh, w- what were, you, were you looking for that power and that, yeah. that sense of fun? Because you, you have a very dynamic, strong style. Um, Would that when, be right? Yeah, the, the, my two favourite flute players ever are Harry Bradley and Conal Agrada. Um Harry's rhythm is incredible um, and you know like stylistically I'd never heard anything like it until I went to Ireland and 
heard him in a session and then bought his CD and then just kind of... I want to say I followed him around like a puppy, but I didn't. <laughs> I wish I had. <laughs> um, he, yeah, he, he's, he's an incredible flute player and he just um, completely broke the idea that, that flute's not a rhythmic instrument. Like a flute can kind of drive a session and it can influence the rhythm. Mm-hmm. Um, How long did you spend in Ireland? Um, just a year. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm traveling around or in one place. I, I landed in Dublin for eight months just because mm. I had work that was stable. Yeah. Um, I was only a baby. I was like 22 or something. Right. So. Was it with music in mind to go yes, there? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. It was like, I need to learn this better. And yeah. Yeah. So then Dublin, what, what did Dublin start giving you from a music perspective? Um some really good friends <laughs> <laughs> that's um, so important that, that it, is yeah it. yeah um it, the, oh, dublin dublin's like a, a melting pot of styles like um just being able to sit there i think being able to listen to paula shaughnessy in sessions every week like just to hear that kind of amazing drive and energy harry would come in sometimes jesse smith was playing there so um just exposure to just this level of mastery Mm. that we that's just really rare here yeah um so if you were there when you were pretty young were you were you playing at a level where you felt comfortable to jump into sessions um with oh yeah yeah me and me and um uh jackie martin who's a field player in dublin we were running on the sessions at the cobblestone oh wow yeah Yeah. Um, great so we'd do that every thursday and then um the session afterwards was run by a fellow called two fellows Nollig and Jer, and um, Paula Shaughnessy would come into that session. So me and Jackie would sit around, sort of all yeah. excited. So I, I wanted to ask you quickly. I mean, we don't have a, a ton more time, but like, yeah. how do you run a session? That's kind of interesting because there's a whole. Yeah, uh, look, even the word "running a session" mm. um, implies some kind of weird leadership. Um, but to me, what like to me, what a really good session is is two friends catching up to play tunes together. And people respecting that, and then kind of sitting in with that, um, yeah, and, and just respecting, I suppose, the the people who started it or who's, whoever's session it is, kind mm-hmm. of understanding that they'll probably want it to operate on their terms. Mm-hmm. Um, that's again, you know, one of those things that I really understood, like, kind of really grasped when I was there. Like, unless it's your session, you you just. Yeah. You just hang on the periphery and be respectful. Or yeah. And or did I read you spent a bit of time in Donegal as well? Or um, The oh. first place I landed was Donegal. Went right. The very first time I ever went there for Frankie Kennedy Week. So, yeah, I think I think that affected me for quite a while. <laughs> right, go on. <laughs> let's, let's unpack that. What, what do you mean? Oh, just, just rhythmically and, yeah. like, preference for tunes. And it was the first time I'd heard Paula Shaughnessy play live and... Um, so it's my fir- it was my first time hearing live traditional music that wasn't amplified or anything or recorded. So just just those sounds, I think, are just they they leave an imprint on you. Yeah. Um, but then I think hearing hearing musicians from Galway hearing this kind of really rocky um, swing also really got into my psyche. Yeah. <laughs> um, we tend to return to ideas of um, trying to figure out regional styles because I'm I'm interested in the notion of how regional styles persist if they do persist given given the fact that we live in a go on yeah. say an it, age when there's when everything yeah. everything is everywhere I all think the that's time. a really so I mean that's a really tricky debate but um I, I mean you I hope think that they're that would existing be there. I think they're I think they're existing in in personal taste, like mm. I, th- you know, like um, when De- when Declan and I went to Belfast, we heard um, f- fiddle players who were super northern and super straight and and really fast, and then another northern fiddler, I think his, I can't remember his name, but who who sounded like he'd come out of East Clare, like mm-hmm. um, I think. Uh, East Clare having a swing, yeah, slow, slower, um, it, yeah, just slightly diametrically yeah. opposite sl- styles, sweet and smooth. really sweet and, and smooth, yeah. yeah um, 
and, and these are all people who grew up in the same city. So, mm-hmm. and it's it's actually the same in Melbourne um, in some ways. So, so I've got my stylic, stylistic preference, Corinne Stratting. Um, she she spent quite a bit of time in Scotland, but so she's got her own very different take on how to play. Um, Ado spent heaps of time in Clare, so his his fiddle playing reflects that. Um, Declan really. So Declan, you spent your year in Dublin, and um, I think that's what that, that's why we play together. I think and get each other because um, we both lived in the same place. Mm-hmm. Um, but but also Declan's got a bit of um, this kind of playful John Cardi kind of just absolutely messing around with the tune as much as, as possible vibe, which is why we like to play together. <laughs> yeah. But th- this is all like personal. Mm-hmm. This is very much personal preference. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's not even to do with, I suppose, the internet and everything, but it, it, it's probably just to do with people are moving around and living in different spaces too. So even yeah. in Ireland, like, I don't know, maybe no, totally. like 50 years ago, yeah. the guy from West Clare didn't live in Belfast. Well, there wasn't as many. And or or wouldn't are. go up there for long weekends. Yeah. 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 Actually, my parents never went to Belfast as they could possibly help it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they, were, they were terrified of yeah. Belfast. So, yeah. um, all right. Well, listen, that is so great to have to have a chance to actually explore some of those um, deeper ideas. And I love the the notion, the way you articulated the idea of uh, music almost as a kind of as a as a community and a and a personal political act almost. Mm-hmm. Yes, In absolutely. A Totally love that. Yeah. That's, so thank you so much. So if if people are looking to 